Hello, everybody. Welcome to Valencia. Thank you for joining this talk. My name is Shay, and today we're going to talk about Falco, bypassing Falco default rule set, and perhaps even how to compromise a cluster without tripping the SOC. Let's start. Let's start with the background, what Falco is for, and what container security is about. Um, and this is my view of container security. You can sort of divide it into four areas, host security, cluster security, uh, pre-deployment and post-deployment. And of course, host security is important because if host is compromised, then it's really hard to reason about the workload security that runs on, on, the, on this host. Pre-deployment is about building the base images in an efficient and secure way, container image scanning, although some people call it vulnerability scanning, but I like to be more precise. Um, scan for exposed secrets, um, static compliance, basically everything that we can do with the static image file of the container. Cluster security, it's all about Kubernetes um, config. And then there's a post deployment, and that's where Falco is coming uh, into the picture, runtime detection. Um, there's also runtime prevention, dynamic compliance, and prevention is about existing, um, mostly about existing uh, Linux security, kernel security mechanism that uh, are sometimes given for free in the container context. Uh, I've recently listened to the cloud, but, uh, cloud security podcast, and they suggested a bit different uh, division uh, into areas of the container security. So they were talking about build um, infrastructure and uh, and runtime, and that's sort of the, the way this this maps on, onto this view. Infra is cluster security and host security. Build is pre-deployment, and the runtime is actually post-deployment. So if that helps to think about it as well. And we can see that where the Falco belongs to, runtime detection through the Falco architecture. Um, Falco is um, built on top of either kernel module or eBPF sensors running in the kernel space. Uh, the events, mostly syscalls and enriched syscalls, are bubbling through the ring buffer up to the user space where a bunch of library, Falco libraries and more, most importantly, the rule engine are taking them, processing them, and, um, and decide whether the certain rules that are expressed as YAML files, um, they, whether the rules should trigger given that event or shouldn't trigger. And the, if rule is triggered, then uh, one can integrate that with the uh, typical cloud stuff like uh, CM or eventing, some kind of eventing engine or gRPC. But for our first purpose, we're going to use STD out today for the, uh, for the sake of simplicity. And you'll see that in the demo. Typical Falco rule, uh, I took in this case, this a lot SSH connection. There is a concept of macro in Falco rule set. Um, in this case, it's called inbound outbound. This is really good concept because uh, because it prevents the rule file from bloating. Um, otherwise, um, if otherwise it would be way bigger than this because the macro can be used by different rules. In this case, this loud SSH connection uses three macros: inbound outbound SSH port, allowed SSH hosts, and one of them is actually has end not condition, which is the opposite of true. So if allowed SSH host is false, then uh, this rule has a chance of um, um, triggering. And then there's a priority, uh, mitrotech, etc. All kind of metadata description. Um, so all good. Now Falco rules, in addition to behavioral detections, they can also be tailored to specific uh, to detect specific exploitation attempts of the CVs if they are constructed properly. And these, this is the example to those those four. Um, but there are more right now. There, there's just four uh, interesting ones that I thought to mention. Now, let's talk about previous work on Falco bypasses. This is not the first uh, talk about it. Um, before that, NCC group did some uh, research, Brad Gizeman as well. They mostly um, described the bypasses around the image naming. Um, Leonardo um, talked about this in one of his talks about the twin syscalls, and I think he also mentioned the uh, similar ev evasion. There is an, an ongoing issue about the sister calls, missing sister calls, for example, open, open net. Uh, execv, execv at, dupe, dupe to, this kind of stuff. And then the recent work by Guo and Zen on DEF CON, uh, they were talking about Tokto 
of uh, file names mostly. Um, so classic example for the uh, in the open ads is called the time of the check of the file name and the time of actual resolution of the file name are different so that there's a, that keeps the possibility of the evasion and then there's they talked uh, quickly about the symlink evasion as well. All right so now with that in mind let's uh, let's go into the interesting section. Um, let's start with the read sensitive file untrusted rule. We're going to use it a lot and let's start with something simple symlink evasion. The um, this is the typical way the Falco is used. We spin container, we do something malicious within the container and Falco is um, spitting this output warning sensitive files open because we're trying to read the its shadow. How can we prevent Falco from knowing that we did this? Well, let's create the ceiling to its shadow. And we do see that there's notice this Falco is still saying something, but it's, that's a different rule, right? Because the previous rule was warning level and right now we're notice so that means that it's at least degradation of the of the detection um, and this by the way this rule the create the monitoring of the creation of the sensitive uh, uh, of the um, symlinks over the sensitive files was uh, one of the protection mechanisms against the talk to attack uh, we'll see why this is not enough because even though we have uh, degradation of detection, which is nice, but we can easier um, get rid of this rule as well. What can we do? We can create the symlink to the unmonitored directory, in this case, it's security. Then we're using the cat to cat the relative path based on the it's a security link. So one step above and then shadow and we see the output of the shadow and Falco is silent because it's confused and the symlink is not resolved in Falco's uh, context. What else can we do? Let's take a look at uh, right below it. See, right below root files. Um, in this case, we see the example of how they can be triggered. So we're doing, uh, we're creating the symbolic link not to the root directory, but we call it the root link and then using it. And of course, it's that easy to bypass this rule as well, uh, just by using the same link to the directory and then using it for the relative path. Okay, what about hard links? Yes, as well, we can, we can use them. Hard link is a direct sort of pointer to the inode. Um, and in that case, Falco, until version 0.31, where we actually committed this uh, the new rule for the hard links it wasn't able to detect it as well um, now this there's a special case of pseudo potential privilege escalation rule um, this case is kind of reversed so let's let's see what we're talking about here there's a the, the last year there was a infamous uh, cv in pseudo which allowed attacker to pretty easily uh, escalate the privileges from the regular user to to root so when I was trying the typical POC by Warwit, I just downloaded it and so uh, and tried to see if that works or not. And it worked very, very easily on Ubuntu. I think that was 18.04 and Falco was silent. So I got interested in what happened there. And what S Trace showed me was that the execve was actually running the user bin sudo and not the sudo edit that the rule would expect. You can see here proc name equals sudo edit rather than sudo. And what happens here is that Ubuntu, in Ubuntu actually sudo edit is the symlink to the sudo. So what the rule, the way it was constructed, what ex was expecting, the rule was expecting the symlink to the binary and uh, it was getting the binary. And of course the exploit was still working. And, and the rule wasn't detected. So that was one of the fixes that we uh, that we committed in the version 0.31 as well. But this this is interesting. The, the other way around of this typical symlink evasion that um, I showed before. All right, enough of the symlinks. Let's uh, talk about procname. Uh, Procnet is the name of the process and many, many Falco rules rely on it a lot. Um, so typical construct here, list, there is a list of uh, login binaries names and management binaries, uh, binaries names. And these lists are used in the rule called read sensitive file untrusted, the same rule that we're, um, we're looking at. 
we're using for our examples. And you can see here the construct and not that I was talking about. That's the, I, I call it accepted construct. Const construct where the rule doesn't trigger. So all we need to ensure here is our process that will read the sensitive file will be named as one of the user management binaries. So what we do here, we, uh, we write a very simple uh, C utility that reads file and we compile it into systemd login D and call it systemd login D um, and using it to dump the, the shadow. And of course, it's fine because uh, Falco thinks that systemd login D is the name of that one of the user management binaries and uh, the rule doesn't trigger. What else can we do? The thing is that um, this approach is not scalable. We can't write utility for for every um, every utility CLI command that we want to use. So, uh, but we can do can create the symbolic link, and so and call it system D login D like like in this case, and use that symbolic link to dump the it's shadow. And again, Falco is silent in this case. So again, symbolic link, but with the proc dot name uh, perspective. Eventually, simple renaming also works. If we can rename cat into the system D login D, there we go. We uh, we have a we have a perfect evasion here. What about parent and ancestors names? Um, yeah, so that's also a problem because in this case, for example, when we're looking at the condition where a proc name should be something and proc p name should be something, what we can do we can come up with a script. Um, and call it password, one of the uh, accepted binary names. In the script, the parent name will call the uh, the proc name, and that's how we sort of build this condition. And once that works, we can we can easily dump its shadow without being being detected. Um, but we can make this evasion even more generic. What we have in the Fuber latest image, and you'll see this image a lot. This is the publicly available image that they came, uh, that they created with various goodies to bypass the, uh, the to bypass Falco. This image creates one of the Fuber's Fuber fake parents. So that binary, that small utility, it knows how to fork um, a series of processes with the depth in this case depth of three, and it calls the ancestor the first initial process as a Google account, forks all the rest and then runs this command. And what it does, it basically tailors specifically this condition because the proc a name of three, it indeed starts and equal to Google accounts. And that's why the Falco is silent in this case. And we can use this utility um, to build the nesting and uh, name as answer, our ancestors as, uh, as we want. Basically. Reverse shell detection. Uh, this is also very interesting. This is a typical reverse shell payload that uh, creates, initiates reverse shell, and um, indeed it uh, it has uh, it causes for uh, three detections here. Uh, so of course the typical attacker can't can't use it. What can we do? We use we can try to use make note and then pipe it into the ANSI. This is also very very known one liner for uh, initiating the reverse shell. Um, however, it's still um, it's still um, shows a detection. However, this detection is way, you know, very easy to do, to avoid because, to evade, sorry, because we can use either a symlink or proc name evasion that we already talked about, but we can we can do something more interesting. How about we use the MSF Venom? And for people who know MSF Venom, they know that this is a de, de facto payload generator. It's, it's a part of um, Metasploit framework, right? And it's very easy to, to generate any type of uh, payload. In this case, I'm generating the reverse TCP payload for Linux, uh, Base64, uh, copying it into the container, marking it as ELF file. And there we go. We see the connection on the host's name and Falco is silent. So indeed, this is, this is a tough problem to detect the payload execution as an ELF where it doesn't have um, uh, a hash, a known hash, but but Falco even not uh, not an uh, antivirus, right? So it's it's a tough problem to detect this type of behavior. Perhaps this could, this should be detected on a network level, though. What else do we have? We can uh, talk about comment arguments manipulation. Um, 
netcat remote code execution in container, you can see that it tries to detect the invocation of ANSI or ANCAT, um, along with a bunch of uh, uh, flags. So for ANSI, for example, there are two execution flags, dash E and dash C, that allow you to execute um, bash, for example, or other program upon the connection. And that's what this rule is trying to avoid. However, we know that Linux, old and big, big Linux utilities, they have so many flag options that it's really easy, re really hard to come up with the rule that will, will block all the pot all potential flag combination. That's indeed the case. In this case, when we, we are using ANSI with dash E, with classic dash E bin bash, it's of course being detected by the netcat runs inside container rule. However, if we just add dash V as in verbosity mode, then the syntactical uh, comparison fails here because the, the proc arx doesn't contain stash e at this point and then and there, there we go the netcat runs inside doesn't trigger anymore um all right what else can we do with the proc arx um we can take a look at the grab private keys rule so it tries to block the find when find when any any search contains id rsa or id dsa and for people who know find know how much how many options does it have and what kind of reach functionality does it have and of course with dash regex it's it's very trivial to bypass we just substitute in the r with with a dot but we can do the same with any other letter and there we have and there we go we don't have syntactical comparison of idea rsa at this point um, and the last interesting rule that I'm going to show uh, bypass is the um, sensitive mount bypass. So the launch container with sensitive mount rule relies on this condition. And I don't know if you see the problem here. The problem here is that this, this comparison is very specific. What the attacker can do, they can mount var run, for example, or var, and then they use subdirectory path to refer to the Docker sub. And I will use it during the full simulation attack later. But in this case, this is very easy to show. Uh, we're just running the Docker with dash v run run. And there we go. Um, we do have a shell less bound rule, but not the mounting rule that should have been triggered. And I think for the sake of time, we uh, I'm going to skip the crypto mining detection bypass. Um, you can end the privileged container detection bypass, although this this one is interesting, but you can you can read about this in the in the GitHub uh, director of the project later if you want, if you're interested. Uh, but let's jump to the toolbed. Our toolbed so far contained two images, Fuber latest. And that's the source. You can see that it can, it has the Docker client, it has kubectl client, and it has a bunch of network utilities, gbash, runc, and I tweak the names of those clients and bash so that Falco won't be able to detect um, uh, them with the uh, static with the tr uh, traditional rules. And then I have the CV 2021-3156 um, image just to to simulate that uh, specific rule trigger that. Uh, that actually didn't, it didn't work. And then, but now it works after our changes um, in case somebody wants to play with, that, uh, with this. And finally, let's go to the interesting part. Uh, let's try to put together all those evasions and see if we can um, perform the full attack simulation. Okay, so the demo setup is, uh, I was running it within the GKE cluster with the COSO nodes and Silicon Node cluster. One word about the cluster that I used is, it was presented in the KubeCon 2019, two years ago. It was really cool, uh, just a testing cluster that shows how to um, just show some attack techniques and defense technique um, and uh, highly recommend it. Um, pretty interesting one and that works perfectly for our case. So it has two attack scenarios, scenario one and scenario two. And scenario one is more basic with the more basic attacker and scenario two is with more advanced attacker. So let's go and start with the detection, detections of the scenario one. Just, just we'll see what, what we expect from Falco to detect within the scenario. So the 
uh, all scenarios start with the attacker given the web shell, assumes that pod is already compromised, and um, and then the attacker starts all kind of reconnaissance enumeration from within the pod. It runs the env, it runs the uname dash r, and then it sees. You know, sorry, they see that the um, the pod the host is part of the uh, Kubernetes pods, and there we go. We have the um, Kubernetes version, uh, etc. We have all the environment variables. We have some kind of service account mounted here, and then at this point, the attacker tries to uh, go to the typical way of uh, compromising the the cluster. So the um, they download the kubectl. They try to use it to get all the resources, whatever they can, and there is a bunch of resources. So uh, it takes some time. Um, there we go. We have the attackers can see the pods, um, and then attacker uses auth can I to enumerate the uh, the permissions that the current uh, pod has with the mounted service account, and apparently attacker can even create pods. Great, and that's what the attacker does. They create the, um, the malicious Bitcoin era pod that, of course, will um, mine Bitcoin. And we can see that this uh, Bitcoin is, uh, an arrow is created successfully. But all this time, we see that the Falco is successfully detecting various malicious activities right here. So this will, for the socket, will be really hard to not to notice any malicious activity in this case. And here I'm using the lint piece just to demonstrate um, if, um, for, for those of you who know, Linpiece is a very known uh, in Linux enumeration and privilege escalation tool, and uh, and it's very popular. So if if typical attacker will will run it on the host, of course nothing will happen. But if they run it on the on the Falco monitored host or container, then then that's a problem because Falco detects a bunch of um, sketchy activities here, and um, of course SOC will not stay. Um, silent in this case. Okay, let's go scenario two detection. Scenario two is a bit more evolved. Um, the attacker is more advanced after the, um, so after the uh, scenario one is finished, the uh, the defense um, actually detected easily that code and they killed it. And so scenario two was able to get the same web shell, but now attacker is more advanced and they want to do something uh, sneakier. And they're using this one liner. Um, this one liner is very interesting because it smashes the host bit namespace, amounts the same uh, process namespace, and launch, launches the privilege, uh, privilege pod. And at this point, container has the access to host resources. You can see that root is the root on host at this point. Um, so I'll skip ahead because at this right, and the attacker has access to the Docker socket. Um, and what the attacker does, they deploy the Bitcoin error this time on the Docker through the direct Docker API rather than Kubernetes API. Um, and that's a bit sneakier because then the defense will, for the defense, it will be harder to find that uh, Bitcoin error. Um, and in addition, what attacker does, um, they want to, they think about the future. So for the persistent, they will, uh, they find the kubelet token mounted on the host and use this token to actually, um, this is the token and they use this token to mount. Sorry, that's the get secrets commands. So yes, uh, attacker can find any get secrets and this is the mount of the, and this is the creation of the um, node port service for the future access. So attacker at this point is able to open the port on a node um, and in the future access this port, uh, this port if needed. And we still see that Falco is very active at the detection. So again, it will be quite easy for, uh, for SOC to detect that uh, something malicious is going on on the, on the uh, particular cluster. So um, put in the attacker's hat. Now we're trying to avoid Falco as uh, um, as hard as possible. 
um, we are doing the same uh, scenario two actions, but with the mind that we don't want Falco rules to trigger. So what we do here, we're still uh, copying the kubectl. However, we're using our name evasion and we um, renaming the kubectl as kcuddl. And from now on, the Falco rules that detect a kubectl activation within the container will not work. And we can easily use the kcuddl from that point. Um, so the one liner that I am using, it's it's a bit trickier here. It's not privileged container at this point. We still smash in the host PID if we can. Um, and I'm running the Fibre latest, which is the Falco ultimate by, by passer image. And as you saw already, it has G bash, which is different from the bash. So that rule will not trigger. And we're mounting var run to get the access to the Docker socket without triggering the mount rule. And we are running the G Docker PS command. And let's see if we have the access to the host level Docker socket. Yes, we do. We can see that there are a bunch of uh, like Kubernetes control plane um, images running here, containers running here, and we, we, ha we do have access to that. And that's great. So at this point, we can run commands. Um, I'm what I'm doing right now. I am running the G Docker. I'm actually deploying the Bitcoin arrow on the Docker. And you can see that Falco is a bit active so far. We just, it just had several, three detections at this point, but it's all the same rule. And this level is notice an expected connection to Kubernetes API. And I'm plowing through using the same one, one liner. This time I'm looking for the, uh, for the kubelet, uh, through the kubelet mounted uh, service account token. I'm looking for the one that will be able to, to open that, to create that node port service and to open the node port. By using this token, we can see that we finally can do whatever we want pretty much. So now we have confidence we can mount, that we can create the node port service. And that's what we do. Node port service, the name is Istio Management, which is a sneaky way to pretend to be one of the Istio uh, services. Um, but for our purpose, what's interesting here is that Falco is still only detects the notice unexpected connection to Kubernetes API. So in this case, if the SOC is, is um, geared towards detection of the warnings or errors or app, then they will not see the notice. Plus they might think that this is some kind of false positive, that's some kind of rule that triggers extensive amounts of false positive and decide to disable this rule if they, if they do see this rule. Um, but let's see if we can do even better than that. All right, so the difference here, this we're still talking about the second scenario. However, I'm modifying the command um, a bit to, to mount varlib as well. The mount command will still not trigger. I'm still using Fuber latest. I'm still smashing host bid. However, I'm performing the gbash command. So now um, I'm supposed to get the uh, bash shell into the container. It's not privileged container, but it has the access to the, to the Docker and the varli and the kubelet tokens for the future. We have one detection so far. We have two detections so far, but we are root within the container and we can pull the Fuber latest again. And the more important that we have the access to the Docker sock. So the neat trick that we're doing right here, we're tagging the Fuber latest as a SysD container. And from this point and on, Falco thinks that SysD that Fibre latest is actually is actually named Sysdic image. So we will be able to bypass that um, unexpected connection to Kubernetes API server because the Sysdic 
is one of the containers that allow to make those calls. And as I called it, one of the accepted conditions in that rule. So let's see that we indeed do that. Um, so at this point, I'm running additional container from within the SysDig container, which is not really SysDig. I call it SysDig, but it's not. It's still Fibre latest. We can see this in the last on the temp folder. It has all those uh, utilities that uh, we put there before. Um, However, right now, from this point and on, Falco thinks that we're in the SysD container. So it will uh, excuse this container from uh, accessing the API, uh, Kubernetes API. And at this point, we can do whatever we want. We can rummage through the kubelet tokens, get in the tokens, and this command is important. I want to list my permissions, whatever I can do, from within the nested container. I'm using the insecure skip TLS course. I'm using the gcube cuddle so that um, Falco will not uh, detect that I'm using actual kube cuddle. I'm using the server from the Kubernetes server host from the parent container. And I'm using the cache deer. And cache deer is important here. I, I want to set it as temp because otherwise, the kubectl will save the cache in the root slash dot cube directory, which would trigger the file otherwise. And we can see that we do have um, the, the permissions to do whatever we want at this point. So at this point, we can create node port and whatever we want. And still, we only have two triggers of unexpected connection. Um, so there we go. We have only two triggers for the full cluster compromise, including the persistent access for the future, hopefully. Um, can we do better than that? I'll leave it as a homework. Um, so for the fixes, if, you, if you're interested in the full project with all the details, those one-liners, you can find them in the BlackBerry GitHub. For the changelog, change uh, we had a series of commits on January 25th that went into the 0 0.31 version discussion and recommendations well uh, very quickly and we can we can discuss it in, more in depth uh, during the Q&A section, section i would say that hooking points are very important because we do want the symlinks for example to get resolved as close as possible to possible to the what kernel see to get that the kernel picture no easy way to prevent attacker from bypassing the rules to rely on proc name and proc a name and file name yes that thing needs to be minimized too many rule includes construct and not because every exception I I understand that that's for false positive, to minimize false positives but that's also the the entrance uh, entry for the attacker and possibility for the attacker to avoid it to evade that rule review rule priorities in the bypass context periodic check of public exploits for the CVE specific rules on the example of that pseudo privilege exploit um, that I showed and then eventually encourage clients to develop their own private rules because then the attacker needs to know the rule set source before doing any action to understand how is um, how to evade those rules, the customer level rules um, before starting the attack. And that's all I had for today. Thank you so much. And I'll be happy to take your questions.